let me start with a little bit of entertainment. It turns out that dolphins do string theory. They blow bubble rings. These are really vortex rings, and the reason that there's um, air inside is a low pressure region inside. You see it gets a little more air and blows a bubble. It's obviously very stable. It's got little oscillations. And the dolphin has this neat trick. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen with my next video. Because the next one is um, really a bit more interesting. Um, all right, so what I gathered from that first video is that uh, in low viscosity fluids, like water, um, there is a stable propagating um, circular vortex ring. And now this video purports to show what happens when you collide them head on. Ooh, look at that. That was really a bit of a shocker to me. Um, let's see if we can replay that one. I better be careful because if I reload the page, I'll probably lose everything. I don't, I think I don't have an internet connection here. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just have to, I'm just, I'm just being careful uh, so as not to cause my browser to try to reload because it has no connection. Okay, let's just see this one more time. Okay, Reynolds number 1,000, two identical vortices collide and then split into many vortices. What's going on there? Okay, this turns out to be a somewhat um, famous experiment in hydrodynamics. And what I claim is that if you play your cards right, you can understand something that is at least close to it, starting from this action that I wrote at the end of my previous lecture. This is an effective action for strings in Minkowski space, just three plus one dimensional Minkowski space, and it consists of a Nambu term with a tension which I persist in calling tau one comma bare for reasons you'll, you'll understand soon. So it's got some tension term. I'm, I'm, uh, I have this sum over I because I'm thinking of maybe having more than one vortex. For instance, in that second video that you saw, there were two. Let's say we have a static gauge where we parameterize the world sheet by time and then one more coordinate uh, sigma, sigma sub I for the ith vortex. And then you would naturally write a tension term like this, and then remember I claimed that the additional terms that come up are integral of some string charge, uh, pardon me, uh, the, the, some kind of string charge times the integral of a Neveschwartz um, two form pulled back to the world sheet. This is a, gr a background value of the Neveschwartz um, two form, and after integrating out the fluctuating part, then you get a interesting um, vortex vortex coupling, which I write here in an approximation corresponding to motions of the vortices, which are slow compared to any propagating degrees of freedom like phonons. So you remember those vortices that you saw colliding, they were moving, well, it's a little hard to see from that quick glance, but they were moving on the order of inches per second, uh, maybe several inches per second, obviously much slower than sound and water. And the dolphins, likewise, it was maybe a few feet per second. We are talking about slow motions, and so it's a good idea to just have an instantaneous um, approximation to the way they interact. So there's 
Poisson interaction that depends on the orientation, the relative orientation of the strings such that um, parallel strings would, would repel, anti-parallel would attract, if I remember my signs right. Okay, and then we have this denominator, sorry if this got a little too far to the right, it's the denominator is absolute value of xi minus xj. Okay, um, oh, before I, before I go on, let me just write down a citation for that second YouTube video since I claim it is a well-known experiment in low Reynolds number flows. It's Lim and Nichols, um, uh, Nature 357, uh, page 225. And apparently the Dolphins also submitted a paper, but <laughs> people couldn't understand the language in which it was written. Uh, so let's see. Um, what I want to do in the rest of this lecture is, is really two things. One is I want to derive that stringy action that occupies the first two boards. And I want to derive it from the Gross-Pitayevsky equation which describes superfluids, for instance, most recently in cold atomic systems. Um, and the other thing I want to do is to consider the classical equations of motion which follow from this action and proceed to solve them with a little bit of help from the renormalization group in contexts which will include um, an account of that collision of two vortices and a splitting into many vortices. So let's get started, unless there are already some questions. Anybody? All good so far? Great. Okay, um, let me just find my place here. How do we get started with Gross-Pitayevsky? Gross-Pitayevsky is a very familiar thing, almost. It's the Schrodinger equation. I'm going to write the Lagrangian. It's the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. So already from these first two terms, you would be able to derive the free particle non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. And then there's only one way in which it's a little tricky. The gross potesky equation has a nonlinear term, the phi to the fourth term. If, if you expanded the square and dropped the uh, phi to the fourth term, then you would really wind up with a straightforward Schrodinger equation. Rho naught, if you made it a function of r, would become v of r, um, and that would be that. So, so the, main, the main point of gross is that you're considering a mild, um, uh, non mildly nonlinear version of Schrodinger, at least mild in the sense that it's, it's a very simple nonlinearity. Okay, so uh, the reason this is describing a superfluid is that a global U1 is spontaneously broken. <clears throat> you get some condensate, which you conveniently write in this form. And rho is approximately equal to the parameter rho naught that you put into the Lagrangian. 
And so we could envision some broader application and elaborations of gross Petyovsky. For instance, if we coupled it to a abelian gauge field, then we would be describing a superconductor. Um, but let's not do that today. We're just going to stick with a global U1. Okay, so how do we get from here to here? You can proceed roughly as follows. And here I'm, I'm approximately following a treatment by Tony Z. You can say to yourself, first, plug that parameterization of phi into the gross Petyovsky equation. Dots are now going to denote always time derivatives, d by dt. Eta, you see, is the Goldstone boson for the spontaneously broken u1. And so there's obviously some massless dynamics for eta. And then you might well expect there's some massive dynamics for rho, which at least we plan mostly to ignore. We can't drop it altogether. All right, so this much I'm going to call L1 because it mostly describes the Goldstone boson dynamics. Oh, I should have said this is a total derivative, so I can drop that entirely. <clears throat> and then this bit I will call L2. And most of the interest for us attaches to L1, so let's take a closer look at it. L1 equals, I'm going to write it in a slightly fancier way, some four vector psi upper mu times d lower mu eta plus this business minus the following. So psi vector are the three spatial components of psi mu. And, and already I've done a little bit of uh, field theory trickery, which I'd better explain. Psi zero is rho, so you can see that the psi zero term plugged into here gives you exactly that rho eta dot term. And, crucially, psi vector is a hubbard stratonovich field which we are adding into the action. And what we're imagining is that we integrate over both psi and eta, as well as rho. And depending on the order of integration, if we want, we can get rid of psi vector and get straight, straight back to the previously quoted form of L1. So this equality is uh, sort of within a path integral treatment, including the hubbard stratonovich transformation. OK, so where am I going with this exactly? Um, I can rewrite L1 equals eta d mu psi mu plus the second term. And then the square, the perfect square, which contributes trivially to the path integral. We can just take care of it with a shifted integration. And, and then what you see is that the Goldstone boson eta is now acting as the Lagrange multiplier, enforcing the constraint that d mu psi mu equals zero. We can solve this constraint cleverly by setting psi mu equals 
one sixth epsilon mu nu lambda sigma h nu lambda sigma, where this is an anti-symmetric three form, and then the equality of mixed partials immediately tells us that this satisfies this divergence-free equation. Now this h nu lambda sigma will indeed turn out to be our friendly Neveschwartz um, three form field strength, the, the, the uh, field strength of what I've previously called B2. <coughs> and so all that I'm going to do um, for the next couple of boards is to track through the consequences of that field transformation and try to show that it indeed sends the gross Pitayevsky action into a form such as I wrote on those leftmost boards. This bit? Uh, what we're thinking of is that this is a this is something in the path integral which contributes only through a Gaussian, and so it gets integrated away, and and then this then this eta comes in and enforces the, the constraint. Yeah. So it's a question of order of integrations. All right. So let's let's remember that I have in mind a split of the field strength into some background value plus a fluctuating piece. And the background value has the following as its only non-zero component. <laughs> so what we're talking about when we describe vortices in a superfluid <coughs> is a string theory, an effective string theory, where the strings are moving in some strong background field of the NSNS uh, three-form field strength. So it's a little bit like non-commutative um, field theory, where you turn on some large non-zero B12. Um, in non commutative field theory, however, B12 is constant, usually, and it has no field strength. So in this situation, it's just a little bit more fancy. You have a non zero um, field strength for, uh, for, the, uh, for the NSNS three form. Okay, so, so what next? We can look at what L2 does. It's easy to see that it gives you Hij squared. And then it gives you some little extra term, which is rather awkward, which I'd really rather not have in the game. And I'll tell you presently why it doesn't matter. So, so evidently this came, this term came from the, the last term of L2, and this unwanted term came from the would-be kinetic term for rho. All right, so putting it together, L1 plus L2 equals minus g over 12 times a contraction of indices. I'm writing it very explicitly for a reason that you'll understand just in a moment. I contract indices with a very particular metric. Um, minus, okay, admittedly I have minus this grad H I, J, K term, which I wish I didn't have. 
let me anticipate why that term does not matter. There's already a derivative tucked into H itself. It's the derivative of B2. And so this term that I don't want is a higher derivative term. As such, it's going to be suppressed by some small length scale. And as long as I am focused on physics at long distances, that term shouldn't matter. And the only question remaining is what is the small length scale which suppresses that higher derivative term? In fact, that small length scale is approximately the size of the vortex core. Now, let me just explain my notation on the previous board that, that uh, eta metric is what you think it is. It's the diagonal metric where you have minus one over c squared, one, one, one. But c squared is not the speed of light because there is no speed of light in the gross Pitayevsky Lagrangian. Instead, it is a speed of propagation of fluctuations of phi. All right. Um, so what you get out of that Lagrangian so far is uh, a dispersion relation for fluctuations in H mu nu sigma, a dispersion relation which mostly looks like this, and it's corrected by one plus some number times k squared a squared where a equals one divided by the square root of m times gross Pitayevsky coupling times rho naught. And sure enough, you can work it out. This is the approximate size of a vortex core. So all seems well with the world. I started with gross Pitayevsky and I obtained this Lagrangian for the uh, NSNS3 form, but where are the strings? I've left something out. Let me come back and tell you what it is. It's got to be the solitonic vortices of gross Pitayevsky, whose core size is on order A. Let me not go through some careful uh, classical construction of the relevant solutions, but only say that the, the defining feature is that the Goldstone boson winds by 2 pi, as you go around the core. So you go around like this, and you experience a 2 pi monotomy in eta. All right, so before I go on to tell you how um, this kind of vortex changes my analysis just a bit, let me pause for any more questions. Yes? Another term in the kinetic energy for psi. So if we, let me put it this way. Certainly if this term weren't there, then this really would be a Lagrange multiplier. That's fair. Um, so your concern is, 
how does the calculation work when the square is still present? Hmm. I see the issue. I'm not sure if I can answer you as well as I should on my feet. Um, Yes, that's a good point. Um, that, that may indeed be the story, that you're taking a small rho over m limit. I don't feel perfectly satisfied by that, but I think it might have to do for now. Sorry I can't do better uh, just at present, but we can talk it over afterwards. Other questions? Yes. Correct. Yes, there's a gapless degree of freedom. This happens for sound waves too, right? Ordinary sound waves have a linear dispersion and they come from compressive waves in a non-relativistic medium. And it's really the gaplessness that forces this upon you. This is then the, the simplest dispersion relation that you can get without a gap. And you do get it because, basically because C squared winds up being non-zero. Right, um, that's right. There is emergent Lorentz symmetry in this sector. There certainly is. Um, I think, again, I would say it's, it's no deeper than the same relation for sound waves, where, where you have a, you know, some compressive term and some inertial term, uh, and, and there's no gap uh, because it corresponds to a symmetry. Um, what we might imagine in, in a special case is that if you, if you were to be able to persuade C squared to go to zero, then you would get an omega squared going as K to the fourth behavior. So that, you know, that could also happen for a gapless system, but this is more generic. So I, th I think that would be the real answer, gaplessness and generosity. Okay. So, Let's indeed go on. So as I'm erasing the board, let me give you a, a, a conceptual preview. The idea here is that, yes, there can be some vortex part of eta, and these vortices can trace out some stringy paths in space at any fixed time, and you want those paths to wind up being the strings that I had written down. And the way that's going to enter in is that you split eta into a vortex part and then a fluctuating part that you can integrate out. And the integration out of eta gives you our previous constraint satisfied by that psi equals dual of h mu nu lambda. And then the part of eta that is still the vortices gives you the coupling of the strings to the NS and S2 form. Okay, so let me give a slightly compressed analysis here. 
what's going on with this kind of function eta that has some winding around the uh, vortex core is that eta is not really well defined right at the core. So if you try to treat it as a function which is well defined, you will encounter a failure of the commutation of mixed partials. In general, the formula that you get looks like this. I'm going to quote in a moment an easy special case that you can just sit down and verify in a few moments. But this is the form I'm really going to use. What we have in mind is that there are some vortices in our superfluid whose positions are specified by these x mu of tau and sigma. The corresponding configuration of the Goldstone field eta will have some failures of the commutation of mixed partials, and those failures will be localized to the position of the vortices. And they'll have this interesting Lorentz index structure. I see I have a small typo. DB x sigma. This formula is a generalization of this easier one, which I would encourage you to try to go ahead and derive on your own. If you start out with precisely this vortex configuration, just in a plane, you can show that you get 2 pi times a two-dimensional delta function, x perp being the two directions, x1 and x2. Uh, by the way, this, this minus sign is really here for aesthetic reasons. Technically, it corresponds to my choice of sign on epsilon ab. Let's not worry too much about it. OK, so this Lagrangian one that I had written down includes the term psi mu d mu eta. And this we split into a vortex part and a smooth part. So we can think of the smooth part as the bit that we integrate over, whereas this is perfectly determined once I lay down a particular configuration of strings. And then if we, if we use the equation psi mu equals a sixth Hodge dual of h nu lambda sigma, we can show that this is going to be minus a half epsilon mu nu lambda sigma times b lambda sigma times this bit. So I've plugged in that equality um, from the top of the, of the of the upper board there, I've assumed that our procedure of using this as a Lagrange multiplier works, and, and I have written down the definition of h nu lambda sigma as a derivative of the NSNS2 form. So now I would say integrate once by parts, and you'll see exactly where things are coming from. Rather, you'll see exactly where the strings are coming from. 
now in this last part of the expression, you recognize what I wrote at the top of the top middle board there as an integral over the string world sheet. So let's just write the whole thing down. Okay, so this is alleged to be nothing other than the coupling of the NSNS2 form to the string world volume. To get it into its final form, all we have to do is remember that L1 is integrated over all of R3, comma 1. And when performing that integral, over R3 comma 1, we can take that four-dimensional integral inside where it's basically killed by the delta function. Okay. So to summarize, what I'm getting at is that integral d4 x of L1 includes a term which is indeed integral 2 pi of the pullback of b2 to the world sheet. This much here, that expression there, that is what we would call the pullback of BAB to the world sheet. Now, what I haven't done, and I think I'm not going to do due to lack of time, is to show you how splitting the NSNS2 form into a background part and a fluctuating part, you can then integrate out the, integrate out the fluctuating part and obtain the vortex interaction that I wrote um, and remarked upon previously as a Coulombic interaction. Instead, what I want to do is get on to a description of solutions of the classical equations of motion, which will be of interest relative to, for instance, that collision of vortices that we saw at the beginning of the lectures. But before I do, any questions about this notion of deriving strings from defects in the Goldstone field? Because this, to me, is a really crucial yeah. um, aspect of the, the whole discussion. Yes? Top line. So are we talking about the very top board here? Yeah. Let's take another look at this. So the right way to look at it really is to understand this equation first. And what this is saying is here you have a smooth function all across R2, except that it can't be defined right at the origin. Okay, it's a, it's a function modulo 2 pi, but that's good enough because we're taking derivatives of it. Its failure to be defined at the origin allows this left-hand side to be non-zero only at the origin. Okay, everywhere else, it's a smooth function, so all your usual arguments from calculus would tell you that mixed partials really do commute. So then, in order to establish that the right-hand side is precisely this 2 pi delta 2 of x, 
what you'd want to do is to say that integral d2 of x of the left-hand side equals, let's say over a region, all of R2. Well, you don't may have to make it a region of all of R2. You can make it some neighborhood of zero. Let's call it some neighborhood M of zero, just this much. So you say the integral over this region, d2 of x to the left-hand side, this, this thing that's, that's uh, 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 the commutation of, of, of partial derivatives, uh, the, a, key, a key step is to say that you use Stokes' theorem once and show that this is the integral around the boundary of m of the exterior derivative of eta. And then what is this thing? Well, ordinarily, if you integrate an exact uh, one form around a boundary, you get zero. But we broke the rules a little bit in that eta is not really a function. It's a function modulo 2 pi. And as you integrate around that boundary, indeed, eta comes back to itself plus 2 pi. Um, and so, so this thing, this integral is going to be 2 pi. Uh, and so it must be that the, the right-hand side is 2 pi delta 2 of x. So, so that, that much gives you sort of the key, the key formula. And then this fancier-looking formula is less than it appears. All it's saying is that on any little segment of string, we have some parameterization that goes through it, and there's a transverse two-dimensional space where we run this argument that I just sort of circled. Um, and, and then the rest of the integral, the, the, the d2 sigma integral here, is just saying, run that argument at every, port, at every point along the vortex. Right. So, um, indeed, that was a good question. Any others? Yes, in the back. So, roughly, H3 is the Hodge dual of the gradient of the Goldstone boson. Um, it, is, it is just another way of tracking that, that slow dynamics. And then, and then B2, B2 is a gauge field that, whose exterior derivative is H3. That's a trivial statement. But it's, it's just as much as to say that when you Hodge dualize, you have some new gauge invariance. It's just the way you've chosen to parameterize the system. I admit it seems a little bit non-minimal, um, but from a string theory point of view, it's obviously the easy way to go about it. <coughs> yes? It will have some sources at the location of the vortices, and these sources will be like electric sources. So it is, it is as differentiable as the, uh, as the gauge potential is in electromagnetism. So if you have an electrostatics problem, there is a failure of differentiability right at the location of point charges but there's nothing any worse than that. Same story here. Okay. Question. Ah. So I have really been careful to avoid getting it, haven't I? Um, there is a good reason there. It is the, the reason that, that the Nambu Goto part is. Um, absent from my discussion, is that it relates to the microscopic dynamics of the vortex core. And, and so I basically, I'd first appeal to intuition and say that vortex core must cost a certain amount of energy per unit length. So that's certainly Nambu-like to start. Um, but I don't want to track the details of it because we're going to see that the Nambu term gets renormalized by the interactions. 
and most of the interesting physics relates not so much to a fixed value of the Nambu tension, but rather to what will be the logarithmic running of that tension. That's a really good lead in to um, my very next topic. So unless there are more questions, maybe I should just, just get straight to it. Yes? Okay. So next topic is fluctuations around a long straight string. There's two reasons that I start with this. Um, one is that I want to show you what the renormalization argument is. And, and the second is that I can't just write down this action, unfortunately, and quantize it the way you quantize ordinary relativistic strings in flat space. The reason you can't just go ahead and quantize it is that this term in the action is actually cubic in the X fields. Let me try to demonstrate that to you. Sorry, I've lost my place in my notes. Right. We have some background field H3, which is DB2. It is rho naught dx1 wedge dx2 wedge dx3. For me, it's going to be convenient just for the moment to choose B2 to be rho naught over 2 x1 dx2 minus x2 dx1 wedge dx3. So what you see here is that this is all cubic in the x's, x1 dx2 dx3. And so when you plug it into the world sheet action, you're going to get some term which is basically x dx dx. That means it's far from, a free th uh, far from a free field theory, and there's no straightforward quantization. And so I better get myself to a situation where I can make a linear expansion to get linearized equations of motion in order to be able to give you a simple account of fluctuations, at least to start. Okay, so how does the story go? Right. I'm going to consider a world sheet embedding, which is mostly a long straight string stretched in the z direction. And I'm going to consider fluctuations in the x1 and x2 directions, where epsilon is just some convenient small, small number that I will expand around 0 in order to get my linearized approximation. And evidently, I'm choosing to parameterize the string world sheet by t and z. So our basic plan is to plug this ansatz into the action. There's a Nambu Goto term, which is going to be minus tau on bear times 
an integral dt dz of the square root of minus d gab. But this is going to be particularly simple for us because to the approximation desired, this is going to be simply c times tau on bear times the integral dt dz. 1 plus order 1 over c squared turns out to be the integrand as the order that we care about. So all we're saying is that the Nambu action for these non-relativistic motions reduces to a potential energy uh, proportional to the length of the string, nothing more nor less. So all the interest is in that integral b2 term. And let me just cut to the chase and tell you the equations of motion. The equations of motion, neglecting the interaction term, look as follows. Okay, so you have only first order derivatives in x1 and x2 because you drop these terms of 1 over c squared, which would ordinarily be present and they give you inertial terms like x2 double dot in the first equation and x1 double dot in the second equation. Those are insignificant compared to the terms that I retained. And, and, I've defined a new quantity, eta sub b. It is the ratio of the bare tension and the strength of the NS and S three form. So these equations look a lot like the equations for Landau levels of a charged particle moving in a magnetic field, and that's no big surprise because what we've got is the magnetic components of the NS and S three form field strength turned on, and the strings are moving in that strong magnetic three form. Okay, so we can solve these equations straightforwardly. You get traveling waves. They look like this. This coefficient xk is just some constant. And the dispersion relation that you obtain is eta sub b k squared, where, as I said, I defined some new quantity eta as the ratio of the string tension and rho naught times mu one. Oh, by the way, Mu one turned out to be two pi for my derivation from Gross Pitayevsky. Okay, so you can see that these are very much not following some relativistic dispersion relation. It's 
It's more like a non-relativistic dispersion. And crucially, this was without interactions. So thus far, I am pursuing the opposite philosophy that I promised you. Instead of getting string tension effects from the normalization group, I have pretended that some unknown tension from the microscopic physics of the vortex core is all that matters. And if that's true, well, you get this dispersion relation. So what about the interactions? In order to take account, in order to take into account the interactions, we just have to remember the following bit of the action, which, as I said, um, can be derived by integrating out the fluctuating part of the NS and S two form gauge potential. And so what this, what this Lagrangian L tilde is describing now is how the long straight fluctuating string, or nearly straight fluctuating string, how that long string interacts with itself. And as I will show here, and as, as you can also read about in the paper by Nicholas and Endlich that I suggested, this interaction Lagrangian modifies the dispersion relation in an interesting way. So the regularization of the integral basically says that it, it makes no sense from an effective field theory point of view to allow the two x's at different positions along the world sheet approach one another closer than a distance of the vortex core's width. So what we should say is that this integral is regulated by an, an inequality such as that. If we don't impose such a condition, then the interaction simply diverges and, and you know, well, we have to regulate it somehow. Thank you. Okay, so this interaction Lagrangian is going to be lambda tilde. I, I, see, I, I see I've got one more quantity floating around. Lambda tilde is the interaction strength between the vortices divided by rho naught mu. And this lambda can be derived in terms of gross Pityatsky quantities if you want to go through the trouble by considering the actual Coulombic repulsion between two um, parallel vortices. Let me not get into that detail. But only say that lambda and lambda tilde are positive quantities. Okay, so how do we deal with this divergent integral? We change variables so that h, h is z tilde minus z. And then we have the following to order epsilon squared. This takes a little bit of doing, I admit, so I'm summarizing the results of a calculation. Okay. And both this first term and this somewhat complicated second term have a 1 over h divergence at small h. So let me write it. This bit goes as 1 over h for small h, but it's convergent 
integrated dh. at large h. OK, so now what we have to do is cancel the divergences in this regulated action. In other words, cancel the divergence that I would get when a goes to 0 using some counter term that will modify the tension. And you see that I've got just the right structure in the action in order to do so. By adjusting the value of tau 1 bare, I can actually soak up some integral dt dz, which would be some divergent term here, into what I call the tension part of the action. Oh, I guess I have to grab those boards. So the modification of the tension will evidently be logarithmic in the cutoff A. And that's why we're going to wind up with some renormalization group structure where the tension runs logarithmically with scale. So let's try to say that carefully. This interaction part of the action is integral dz of, all right, the first term here is easy to integrate. That's just a log. Now, this 1 over h, it's a pain. This 1 over h actually has a logarithmic divergence also at large h. Sorry about that. It just means that we have to impose by hand some kind of infrared cutoff saying that our system is of size L, or somehow the vortex is of size L. When we consider vortex rings, this will be more graceful because the ring has an overall size that would go in place of L. OK, so then we have some additional term, evidently a rather more difficult integral. That, that integral of, the, of this mixed polynomial and trigonometric piece can be done exactly. And I claim that the result is k squared log ka plus terms that are finite as a goes to 0. OK. So the tension term, the tension term that I wrote here is accurate through order epsilon to the 0, I actually need it through order epsilon squared in order to run my entire argument. Um, it's easy to see that the appropriate expression is this eta sub b times the square root of 1 plus epsilon squared xk squared times k squared. This little square root factor just comes from the square root of d a b, or perhaps more intuitively, this is just telling you the element of length along the perturbed vortex. So to order epsilon to the 0, it's 1. The vortex gets a little bit longer because of its perturbations, and this is by how much. And so at the end of the day, Here's the real punchline. You find that when you add up this rescaled tension part of the Lagrangian, rescaled just by a factor of rho naught times mu1, plus this rescaled interaction, 
um, what you get is integral dz of minus eta of L, to be defined in a moment, minus a half eta of 1 over k times epsilon squared xk squared k squared, where where eta of L is going to be the running tension. So in a way, if you understand this calculation, you understand essentially everything that I want to do today. Eta of L is going to be my eta sub B, which remember is just the tension of the string scaled by uh, rho naught v1, plus lambda tilde times log L over A, which is as much as to say there's a normal, there is a renormalization group equation for the tension, which is this. All right, so that's really a good place to pause for questions. And I see I am, let me see, I'm, I'm about, I've got 15 minutes left, thereabouts. Was there a question here? Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I believe I believe in the boards that I just erased. We, we could go back uh, and look more carefully, but I believe in the boards I just erased. When I wrote the Nambu action, I really should have included the spatial derivative squared, dx squared, dzx squared. And when, when we expand that out, you're absolutely right. That is what's going to give you the dz squared x term um, in, in the equations of motion. So the actual term that I wrote down for, for the Nambu action was not quite enough to derive those, those equations. The, the main point I was trying to make in writing down such a small amount of the Nambu action, such a truncated amount, was that ordinarily Nambu includes x dot squared terms. And those I really don't care about because they're suppressed by a factor of 1 over c squared. But that factor of 1 over c squared obviously is absent for the dzx quantity squared terms. Excellent point. I'm glad you mentioned it. Other questions? Okay. So. Just to run over the philosophy one more time, we've got some, some long string which has ripples on it. And there are two scales, therefore, in the problem, which I've drawn as only mildly different on this board, but they could be very, very different. And in order to describe the dispersion relation of waves on this long string, the appropriate dispersion relation is going to be eta evaluated at scale 1 over k times k squared. In other words, the wave doesn't particularly care how long the string is. It can be very, very long. <coughs> 
it propagates kind of one wavelength at a time using the string tension that it knows about at its scale. Whereas the overall string has some divergence in its energy which relates to its overall size. And this divergence in the energy of an extremely long string, this infrared divergence, is a familiar feature of superfluids where you have a global U1 that's broken. The logarithmic divergence of, of, uh, of energy of vortices is, is then uh, essentially a consequence of the rotation of the fluid around this vortex far away from the vortex. All right, so I'm going to cure that infrared divergence of the energy by considering instead of long, nearly straight strings, vortex rings whose finite size cuts off the infrared divergence naturally. But then what I want to do is consider perturbations of these vortex rings so that I can investigate the stability of some collisions such as I showed you early on in the video where two, two vortex rings came in, hit one another, expanded, and then broke up into a bunch of small vortices. So just to get a preview going in case I don't finish with all the details I'd like, the point of the next analysis will be, number one, I can describe analytically the trajectory of strings, perfectly round strings that come in and hit one another and spread out, as you saw. And I can describe, well, partially analytically, the development of an instability as the strings are getting bigger in the transverse plane. And this instability is strongest for a rather large wave number. And that wave number, that large wave number, explains why the strings break up into, the two strings that collide break up into many strings rather than just three or four. So that's the gist of the rest of my lecture. Let me get started and see how far I get. Ah, but there's one other thing I should tell you first. It is that once you have this equation, it means with lambda positive, it might be is positive, that at some small L0, some fundamental length, the rescaled string tension will be, will be zero. And for vortices that are at a smaller length scale than this, eta will be negative. That sounds awful. Negative tension sounds like there's some obvious instability, but it ain't so. It's not so bad because we're working in this non-relativistic regime with a strong three-form field strength so that the equations of motion don't have inertial terms. And without those inertial terms, without those second derivative um, x double dot terms, a formally negative string tension, such as you would get for lengths less than L0, is not going to cause any instability in the classical equations of motion. There can be instabilities, as we'll see. You'd think that that would be one when eta becomes negative. But in fact, isolated, perfectly round vortices can propagate nice and stably, even if their length, even if their circumference, is rather smaller than L0. I don't have time really to demonstrate that, but it's easier than the computation I'm going to do. Okay, so what is the calculation I really do want to do? 
that colliding vortex problem. And here's how I set it up. I'm going to say I've got one vortex. And I'm going to specify its spatial position as a function of time and angle around the vortex as some vortex radius r of t plus some linearized perturbation, same notation as before. R sub m of t is just some function of t which tells me the amplitude of a perturbation on the vortex with m nodes as you go around the circumference. So it's got this angular modulation, cosine of m theta. So the x1 Cartesian component is going to be this slightly complicated looking beast. The x2 component will look like this. And the x3 component will look like this. And I've got, I've got a function z sub m of t, which tells the vortex how much it's perturbed from a perfectly planar shape. All right, so that's one vortex. And then I'm going to collide it with another one. And for simplicity, not for any fundamental reason, but just for simplicity, I'm going to assume that these vortices are perfect mirror images of one another. I'll go ahead and write the equations, but the words are more informative. Perfect mirror images. I forgot the epsilon. Okay, there we go. The only um, difference really is that I've got some different parameter theta tilde for the second vortex and, and I put in a minus sign here. Now, the, the uh, approach to the problem is going to be take this ansatz, plug it into the action, derive equations of motion as ODEs for R of T, Z of T, Rm of T, and Zm of T. So, I'd like to pretty much skip the details and start quoting to you the results. But before I get into skipping the details, I should add one big caveat. Whenever you take an ansatz like this and want to blithely plug it into an action, you better be sure that the ansatz is consistent. In other words, I might suppose that I could add in an extra term. Well, let's put it in an extra term here. I might suppose that I might be able to add in an extra term, maybe call it y m of t times the sine of m theta tilde. I better have an argument for why this term added to the third component here would decouple from all the others. So that's a detail I'm suppressing it's not so obvious that this particular perturbation would decouple. It does at the end of the day. I would say it is obvious that you don't have to consider perturbations 
with different m's simultaneously because in, in linear perturbation theory, different Fourier components are going to uh, decouple. But suffice it to say, trust me, I've been careful. This is a consistent ansatz um, which, for which the equations of motion that you get are sufficient to give you a full solution of the full equations of motion. All right, so what's the story? How much time do I have left, Martin? Okay, but I want to leave a little time for questions. Okay, what's the story? The most interesting part of the story is this. There's an interaction part of Lagrangian. We've, we've seen it before. I rescale as before by the superfluid density and the charge of the vortex. And then the Lagrangian turns out to look something like this. And this is the interaction between the two vortices. The self-interaction of each vortex can be easily accounted for up to terms that are finite in the a to zero limit just by using the appropriate running string tension at the appropriate scale. So the, the non-trivial part of the calculation is tracking now the interaction between the two vortices and this winds up being a bit complicated. Let me parameterize the answer, and then I'll tell you what I can about the functions that appear in this parameterization. So first of all, as usual, I'm only interested in the action up to order epsilon squared. So there are higher orders than epsilon that I'm, that I'm dropping. The quantity Q is defined as Z divided by R. And essentially for dimensional reasons, everything winds up being mostly a function of Q up to some overall scales. Small typo. So you can show that this overall integral goes as a single power of R. That's basically because you have a power of R here and here and an inverse power of R here. So, so just on dimensional grounds, this unperturbed term that has nothing to do with the fluctuations has to be some linear factor of r times some possibly complicated function of the ratio z over r, and likewise the perturbation terms have to be what they are. Now, f of q, I can write down for you pretty straightforwardly. These other functions, the capital Qs, are important for the calculation, but they're enormous integrals. They're enormous integrals in terms of combinations of trigonometric functions and square roots. So nothing really impenetrable, just long. Therefore, let's focus our attention on f of q and what it does.
first. Okay, so f of q equals an integral 0 to 2 pi d alpha. Alpha is a lot like that variable h we encountered before. It's the difference of theta tilde and theta, and you get this sine squared alpha over 2. So this is something that can be done in terms of elliptic functions. It's not really very interesting to do so. What's interesting is that f goes monotonically from infinity to 0. It's on order 1 over q cubed at large q, and it's on order um, minus log of e squared q over 4 at small q. Now, it turns out that large q is the same, effectively, as large separation between the vortices. And so what the vortices do is they start at large q, and they come into smaller and smaller uh, values of q. Yes, OK. What, what's my time, really? I've only got four minutes left. OK. So we have an exact unperturbed trajectory, which is f of q equals r hat log r hat minus some initial conditions. I will define this quantity momentarily. Where r hat equals r over L naught. So this comes, like I said, just from solving the equations of motion that I obtained for r dot and z dot. And then, as Martin reminds me, I'm really nearly out of time. Let me just then qualitatively comment that this does describe what you saw in the video, where the, where the vortex rings come together and then quickly spread out. In the spreading out phase, you can do a stability analysis. It looks like this. Turns out that r hat itself is a nice time variable. looks like this. These w's are determined in terms of the q's. They're essentially the same thing as the q's. And this equation follows precisely from whatever you derive as rm dot and zm dot. So just to finish then, what I have to do in order to finish a, a stability analysis is find the eigenvalues of w. And here's what they look like. Details evidently to be discussed in private. The eigenvalues of W control stability. They look like this. In the plane of R hat and M, the boundary of stability is at M equals R hat. These are stable. At sufficiently large m, things are stable. But there is a line of the most unstable eigenvalues at, 
m equals r hat over the square root of e. Gosh, that's an important equation. Let me write it where you can see it. m equals r hat divided by the square root of e. That is, it turns out, from an analysis of the eigenvalues of w, the locus of the most unstable eigenvalues, the most unstable modes. And the point is that this is a big number for reasonably large vortices. And that's why you see the splitting into so many strings, not just a few. Furthermore, the splitting, if you look back at that video, is very sudden, corresponding to the fact that the eigenvalue of w at this m is quite large. Let me stop there and see if there are further questions about this or other qu topics.